Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast exploring Scottish history, nature and culture. I'm Annie, hidden amongst the weeds. And I'm Jenny, lost in the bracken. In this episode, we're examining the biology and folklore of a few of our favourite Scottish plants. Now, I never thought that I would be this intrigued by the common plants that we're speaking of. But I'm hoping that this episode will help bring the landscape to life. Because we've chosen a couple of specimens that are incredibly common across Scotland. A little warning in this episode that we'll have discussion of death and dissection, but only in a folklore context. We'll be speaking about old superstitions relating to medicine, so please remember that these are superstitions and not medical advice. So Jenny, tell us about your plant persona. I am a wee plant that inspires poetry, like this nugget from Walter Scott. Go on then, my leafy pal. High away, high away, over bank and over brae, where the copsewood is the greenest, where the fountains glisten sheenest, where the lady fern grows strongest. Lovely, lonesome, cool and green, over bank and over brae, high away, high away. So you're a lady fern then? Yes. I am Newman's Lady Fern, to be precise. Ethereum flexile to my friends. Well, the Latin-speaking ones, at least. I am native to Scotland and found all over this beautiful country. From shady, damp forests to high mountain tops, I thrive amongst the boulders up there, where there is less competition from bigger ferns. For I am but a wee fern, unfurling in the shelter of the scree that surrounds me, high up on this exposed mountainside. I love nothing more than the snow blanketing me in the winter and keeping me from freezing. Which seems counterintuitive, I know, but you can trust my scientific knowledge of thermal insulation and heat transfer. I'm a fern. The working of nature is a wonderful thing. When the spring comes, as my roasty, toasty white blanket melts, It quenches my thirst. Little streams form in the gullies between the boulders. I am well watered, and my tightly curled fronds can slowly unfurl, reaching out into the crisp mountain air. While I may look feathery and delicate, hence my name, the Lady Fern, I am in fact incredibly hardy. You try living up here all year round, hmm? I don't mean to brag. Oh, (laughs) who am I kidding? Yes, I do. But a good friend of mine, William Inglis Clark, wrote about me in one of his pieces for the Scottish Mountaineering Club Journal in September 1900. Here's what he said. There, in every crevice of the rocks, are hidden the lovely rock rose, or pink-flowered lichens, or graceful lady fern, growing with a luxuriance scarcely dreamed of. A luxuriance scarcely dreamed of? Stop it now, William. You're a married man. Whilst everyone's wondering why the fern seemed to change accent so frequently, <laughs> let's have a little ad break. A big thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Weebox, who managed to pack the joy and excitement of this beautiful country into a wonderful Wee Box. Wee Box is a monthly subscription gift box that is designed to share Scotland with Scots and Scots at heart all over the world. Weebox select delights that are often exclusive or can't be bought outside of Scotland. It's a fantastic gift and great value for money. Plus, Weebox supports Scottish businesses, artisans, the environment and charities too, which are all things that we adore. Visit weebox.co.uk and use code STORY10, that's STORY10, at the checkout for an exclusive discount. Yay, Weebox! Yay for Weebox! Annie, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Mm, Jenny, I think I'd really love the ability to turn into a goblin and have my own little hidden cave where I can just hide and be happy. Okay, cool. I mean, you kind of already have that. (laughs) (laughs) 
you could just do that, you know? Like, there's plenty of caves around here just waiting to be inhabited. I know, but I'm not a goblin, so it doesn't feel authentic. Not a goblin yet. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jenny? What would your superpower be? Easy. Invisibility. Ah, classic. And what would you do if you were invisible? Uh, I would go to the next Inverness Caledonian Thistle football game and every, like, 12 minutes or so, I'd pick up the ball and just run away with it. You know, just spice things up a bit. I mean, if you see the way that they play, it's quite likely someone is already doing that. (laughs) But that's certainly one way to squander a superpower. (laughs) Said the cave goblin. (laughs) But unlike you and your goblin superpower, this isn't just a distant dream of mine, Annie, for I have a plan. While I was researching the wonderful lady fern, I stumbled on the Scots word fern seed, which means to render oneself invisible by means of a fern seed. And I was like, well, isn't this a fun rabbit hole I should jump down head first and covered in freshly churned butter? I mean, that would make you particularly well lubricated for getting down that rabbit hole. Oh yeah, and my slippery slide down the rabbit hole led me to a piece in the Greenock Telegraph in 1905. Here, the author tells us, The wondrous fern seed was credited with ensuring good health, with the power of discovering gold. Its fortunate possessor became endued with the might of forty men. But the best known of all its mystic powers was that of conferring invisibility. The seed had to be collected with peculiar ritual. According to some, it was a cherished favourite of the devil and could only be taken from his keeping at midnight on the eve of St John the Baptist. So the eve of St John the Baptist is the 23rd of June It is, yes, and your in-depth knowledge of the Days of the Saints never fails to amaze me, Annie. Always on the ball with them. One of the core textbooks in archive school was a book that taught you the Days of the Saints. So I would imagine that most archivists just never open that book, but you were really really big on those Saints days. (laughs) (laughs) But this is a really important day of the year, for it is right around Midsummer's Eve. And as we know, this is a time thick with superstition. While this article states it's the eve of St John the Baptist that the seeds must be collected on, other sources claim that it is in fact Midsummer's Eve, the night of the summer solstice, the shortest night of the year. And that this night is the only time that you should try and steal some fern seeds from the devil. This really makes sense because it's when the devil has the least amount of night time to be able to do his mischievous acts, whatever they may be. But I feel like that's splitting hairs because the solstice is only one or two days before the 23rd of June. Aha, but Annie, the devil is in the detail. (laughs) Have you ever tried splitting hairs with the devil while deep in a forest and trying to steal his fern seed at midnight? Well, I'd know to only do it on the eve of St. John the Baptist. Our writer goes on to tell us that. At dusk of that day, the fern puts forth a tiny blue blossom, which soon disappears, leaving the seed vessels, which burst and liberate the magic seed precisely at midnight. And this seed must be caught on a white cloth before it reaches the ground. Now, let's say you do get the date right and the devil is preoccupied down in Argyll and Butte taking advantage of the thinning of the veil. You've got your cleanest, whitest hanky out and you're waiting under the leaves of a beautiful unfurling fern. But alas, it is still no easy task to catch the seed of a fern. For even in the brightest light of day, no one could find fern seeds. And yet, ferns grow everywhere. Thus, folk deduce that fern seeds must be invisible. Okay, and then logically a person in possession of an invisible fern seed would be able to harness its power and render themselves invisible. Precisely. Now, let's say you get lucky and you see the flower bloom. 
and you catch whatever is released in your white cloth before it touches the ground. What you're to do next is immediately wrap it up safely, put it deep in your pocket, rush home, lock your door, run three times round your kitchen table anti-clockwise and then buy a ticket to the next Inverness Caledonian Thistle football game. (laughs) (laughs) Why do you need to buy a ticket if you're invisible? I mean, we don't want to cheat the players at it, you know? They they deserve (laughs) monetary compensation for all the work they're putting in. (laughs) You can tell you got a sports scholarship to uni, Jenny. (laughs) Power of invisibility and you're buying your ticket. (laughs) But beware, for we are also warned. Our forefathers were sure to give grave warning that the process was not without danger. For not only would a muckle-horned clutie, but elves and fairies and pixies alike come after ye, for they all resented the stealing of their potent seed by mortals. Oh no, not a muckle-horned clutie. I don't, I don't actually know what that means. What is a muckle-horned clutie? <laughs> it seems fun, I'm not gonna lie, it seems kind of fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so muckle means large. I can think of a quick example. There's a river nearby where I grew up called the Muckle Burn. So a burn is a stream and the muckle is just saying that it's a very big stream, possibly into river category now. So what this is telling us about our horned clutie is that it's a very large variety of horned clutie. Okay, but I thought clutie meant rag or cloth, like the clutie well out on the Black Isle. So is this just saying it's like a giant horned quilt coming to get you? Because I'll be honest, that sounds like the original ghost in a blanket. (laughs) Yes, in most cases, clouty does mean a piece of cloth, a little rag. But a clout can also mean the cloven hoof of an animal, or you can just use it to speak about cloven hoofed animals themselves. So you could say there's some clouts on the hill, so there's sheep on the hill. So if we're talking about a large horned clouty, who do we know that has cloven hoofs? Landowners. (laughs) 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 Okay, so we do have the large estate owners and the people with a dozen Airbnbs. But the other figure, who is very large and has horns and cloven feet, would be the devil. (laughs) Ah, potato, potato. (laughs) Well, beware, folks. If you attempt to harvest the invisible and powerful seed of the fern, you may end up not with just angry fairies, but also a large horned devil coming to get you. You better hope that you caught the seeds, because the only way you're getting out of this one is by turning yourself invisible and disappearing into the night. (laughs) Yes, So this myth that fern seeds can make you invisible is really common and variations can be found across the British Isles and into Europe. And all these people weren't wrong because the seeds technically are invisible because they don't exist. Instead, ferns reproduce via spores and very successfully too. Bracken, the most common type of fern in Scotland, can cover huge swaths of land. It's estimated to cover up to 100 square kilometres of the Scottish uplands. Wow, that's a lot of ferns. It is a lot of ferns. But what's even more amazing is that it also spreads via its huge root system. And the roots under just a quarter of a square kilometre, so that's like 25 hectares, can weigh up to 500 tonnes. That's a lot of heavy, heavy roots. And a lot of invisible seeds to try and collect. But the reason ferns don't have seeds is because they evolved long, long before seed-bearing plants did. So not only do they look pleasingly prehistoric, they actually are prehistoric? Yep. And maybe it's something about this innate ancientness that means that many species of fern are thought to hold magical powers... Perhaps the most mysterious of all of these is the moon fern. This funny little fern has very distinctive half-moon-shaped leaves that look more waxy than regular fern fronds. 
and they're also really hard to find. I can confirm this as I went on a dog walk while researching this and searched for a solid two hours without success. So, you know, must be rare. Mayhaps they are invisible. Well, kind of, actually, yeah. Because they mainly live underground and get most of their nutrients from their fungi friends. We're back to my goblin cave dwelling. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you're going to get most of your nutrients when you're a goblin, Annie? <laughs> mushrooms. Yes, I love mushrooms. Yep. I'm going to be a little cave goblin with my mushroom stroganoff, happy as anything. <laughs> but occasionally, and hopefully like you as well when you're a goblin, Annie, they do poke their head up from the mulchy depths and put forth their little moon-like leaves. They're small though, as they only grow up to 10 centimetres tall. But all this just adds to their beauty and mystique. And with beauty and mystique comes folklore. Hence why there's so many tales out there about me. Clutie Jenny is my favourite one. <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. The twist is I'm not actually a devil, I'm just invisible and under a sheet scaring all the players in the changing room at the Inverness Cali Thistle Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a true story of creepy beauty and mystique. <laughs> and the moon fern is also called moon wart. Before modern medicine, it was believed to stop bleeding, but it was also thought that it was able to create gold as well as aid in getting to the fairy realm. And um, imagine you have a wee accident and you've got a little cut and so you put some moon fern on the wound to stop the bleeding because that's the weird folklore about it mm -hmm. and then you accidentally end up in the fairy world for a hundred years <laughs> that wouldn't be lovely but i think i read somewhere that the moon fern was used as wee saddles for the fairies to travel to the supernatural realm so your cup might just gallop away from you with a fairy on it <laughs> i love that you cut your finger and then next thing you know you've got a fairy riding a fairy riding the tiny leaf that you've put on <laughs> <laughs> but so magical was the moon fern that it was sought after by witches they would head out under the cover of night with only the light of the moon for guidance in search of the potent plant they would harvest it and take it home and use it to enhance their powers. So there's a charming Scottish saying that likely comes from Galloway that says, Red bracken brings milk and butter. It means that at the point in the season when the bracken changes colour from green to reddish, the autumn herbage is at its best and... This is good for cows, and this is good for dairy production. Ah, so if you're looking to churn some butter to rub all over yourself so you can jump down a rabbit hole, it's better to wait a few weeks until the bracken browns. I've really enjoyed learning about all the various ferns of Scotland. I mean, bracken is so common that I just sort of assumed I knew all about it, or there was nothing really to know about it. But nope, there's so much special stuff about ferns out there. So, I don't know, next time you see some ferns, take some time to appreciate their fronds swaying in the wind. But do watch out for ticks, because I had to walk through a big patch of bracken the other day, and when I came out of it, I was just covered in ticks. It was horrible. They are the real devils of Scotland. <laughs> you can say that again, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> the wee horned cluties. <laughs> Well, Jenny, I'm incredibly nutritious, but I sting. What am I? Uh, my attachment style. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm a nettle. Ah, I was close. <laughs> I don't think it was close, Jenny. Are you covered in tiny hairs that prick people if they get too close and impale their skin with tiny little doses of biochemical irritants? Uh, no, I actually had those lasered off in the early 2010s. <laughs> Well, much as I love your skincare routine, I love nettles more. And I'm glad you got your poisonous barbs removed. One of my fondest childhood memories was when my mum would get me and my brother to put on our winter gloves 
in the springtime and go and pick some nettles so that she could make nettle soup. And to this day, nettle soup is still in my top five meals of all time. Your mother is a very smart woman. Sacrifice the children's hands, not her own. I mean, it makes sense. Who's going to make the soup if their hands are all stung and swollen? Mm. This is true. (laughs) But nettle stings aren't really that painful for me. I think it's because I spent so much time picking them as a child. (laughs) Have you ever been stung? Um, yeah, loads. It's the prickly itchiness that I can't bear of them. Oh, it ooh, it gives me the heebies. But we did actually learn a top tip for dealing with stings from the woodland ranger Emma at Cashel Forest Trust. Yes, we've spoken about nettles before, and I said that my papa would rub dock leaves on the stings. But Emma taught us that it's the stem of the dock leaf, not the leaf itself, that relieves the nettle stings. So if you break the stem in half, this rich jelly is hidden inside, which it's it's sort of similar to aloe vera. And this is what you have to put on your stings for them to be soothed. What a useful little tip. It was, really. And it's kind of cool to see that we knew on some level that dock leaves were good for nettle stings but a vital bit of information has sort of been lost in the passing down through generations of this to the point where people are just like rubbing the leaves on themselves when actually there's a whole secret hidden gel in there that we sort of, as a people, forgot about. Which means that we can now safely collect our nettles for our delicious soup. Woo! I've been reading a lot about nettle soup and it surprised me. (laughs) So one thing made me a little bit sad. I read in a Victorian book that nettle soup was a peasant food for the Scottish poor, Mm. which made me feel really sad because I always felt very rich whenever my mum made nettle soup. Aw, what does it actually taste like? I don't think I've ever had it. It's fresh and peppery, similar to parsley or rocket, but also delicate like spinach but without the funny iron aftertaste that you get from spinach you know like Mm -hmm. you've been sucking on a penny yep (laughs) and then it's got a sprinkling of childhood nostalgia and fairy magic okay yeah well if it makes you feel any better nettles are definitely bougie again with the metropolitan foraging elite (laughs) they got some like street nettles I think that's why I've never had it, because I grew up in a city, so nettles were a weed. And I actually was quite surprised when I found out that you could make nettle soup, because I was like, why would you just sting yourself as you're eating it? But the sting goes, right? No, it it totally inflames your mouth as you're <laughs> chewing on it. Mm, it's like Scottish spice. <laughs> the stings on nettles are very delicate little hairs. So as soon as you give them a good wash, as soon as they've been blanched in water, they'll lose their stings completely. Okay. It's very easy to break these tiny little stingy hairs. And if you're ever picking a nettle without gloves, if you go for the stem and instead of pulling it lightly, press really hard, sometimes you can just avoid getting stung. Not that I'd ever recommend anyone picks nettles without gloves, but this is genuinely what me and my brother would do. (laughs) (laughs) Such hardy children. (laughs) Because it's only really when a nettle brushes you that you get stung. If you just really grasp it tight, you can break those um, hairs and they can't impale your flesh. I feel like that is the best medical advice we've ever given on this podcast. (laughs) I mean, it's it's dreadful advice, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it into the bloopers because I think it gives you a real insight into my psych and why I am the way I am. I'm the kind of person who'd grip a nettle hard to avoid getting stung, and I oh, yeah. feel that's something I need to talk about in therapy. Rip it out of the ground. Anyway, I'm glad nettles are back in style. There's such marvellous folklore about our stingy little frenemy plant. Jenny, what effects do you think nettle soup would have on the body? Uh, Good nutrition. I'm going to guess vitamins A, C and K. Yes, like many leafy greens. (laughs) Just like you know all your saints, I know all my vitamins. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, nettles have lots of vitamins that 
our bodies can use. But according to folklore, nettles also have cleansing properties for the soul, and often in the folklore it's cleansing for the blood itself, to the point that nettle soup can almost be seen as a bit of a hot steamy bowl of exorcism. <laughs> exorcism? <laughs> but in soup form. <laughs> I mean, the film would have been significantly shorter if they just gave her some nettle soup at the beginning. Although maybe they did, and that's where all the green bile comes from. (laughs) If the exorcist had been Scottish folklore, they'd have brought her the nettles and she'd have been cured and Mm -hmm. everything would be lovely and none of the bad things would have happened. I just want to highlight that we are going to be discussing nettles as a remedy in folklore and we are definitely not encouraging anyone to view nettles as anything other than a delicious meal and if you're concerned about any of the issues that we're speaking about please seek help from a medical professional (laughs) instead of a nettle patch (laughs) unless it's a bit about exorcisms in which case call me for all my ghost extraction seances and services usually i just take the sheets out for a dry clean (laughs) so (laughs) in folklore it was believed that nettle soup made in springtime would cleanse the blood spring is when the plants are youngest and taste best so that's why the legend gives them most potency in spring but there's a lot of curious mythology about the blood cleansing to explore however let's start with the more mundane world ailments that nettle soup was thought to cure and then go into the supernatural curses. <laughs> so, <laughs> nettle soup was thought to be able to heal a variety of issues, from skin conditions to diseases of the liver and heart. But there's one ridiculous story from Renfrewshire which shows a mermaid giving unsolicited advice to a funeral party. I'm not going to lie, Annie, if a mermaid doesn't show up at my funeral, which will be entombment in a cairn, and give unsolicited advice, I will be very disappointed from beyond the grave. (laughs) But in this story, the mermaid was swimming happily upon the Firth of Clyde when she spotted a funeral service happening near the shore. The mermaid hastened over and saw a young woman being laid to rest in a peaceful ceremony after dying of consumption. Consumption was the common name for tuberculosis, which is an infectious disease that impacts the lungs. It was called consumption because one of the major symptoms is weight loss, so it appears as though the person suffering from this disease is literally being consumed by it. The main preventions are screening and vaccination, and it can only be treated with antibiotics. Yet, our mermaid still swims on by and gives the funeral party a little rhyme advising how diet could prevent consumption deaths. She uses the Scots word muggins, which means mugwort. However, in this context, I think it refers to a kind of nettle decoction. Decoction? I think you mean a potion of nettles, Annie. For the nettles would be boiled in water until they became a pulp, and this pulp was then sieved and the liquid would be bottled. The longer it was left to brew, the more powerful it became. And lore tells us that it would be used up until it was about three years old. That is some well-fermented nettle juice. I think that this is the muggins that our mermaid is referring to, the nettle potion, as you call it, Jenny. (laughs) Our mermaid is just doing her mermaid thing, splishing and splashing and gossiping with some seals when she spots this funeral procession. She quickly abandons her seal friends to go and give some mermaidly advice to the humans. From the murky waters of the Clyde, she shrieks up at them. If they would drink nettles in March and eat muggins in May, say many bra maidens would na gang to the clay. Our mermaid is wailing that if people were to eat more nettles and drink more nettle potions, then so many young women wouldn't find themselves in early graves, buried in the clay as such. This mermaid is like the first big con artist wellness fitfluencer. 
Yes, her advice is very unhelpful. Never, <laughs> never at anyone's <laughs> graveside does any mythological creature need to pop up and announce that they should have eaten more vegetables, you know? <laughs> Some, a few nettles would have prevented the poor soul's death. No, that's Aunt Miriam's job. <laughs> <laughs> and just in case anyone is in any doubt, nettles will not cure tuberculosis or any viral disease. Ah, but our con mermaid is having none of that. She'd have had your nettles, love. I wonder if she was selling them. She could be like, the pyramid scheme queen of the sea. They call it mermaid level marketing, MLM. That's how Atlantis <laughs> was built. <laughs> and exactly why it collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> mermaid level marketing, that's funny. But then, nettles were thought to be one of the most powerfully cleansing plants that there is. So let's go into how nettles could heal slightly supernatural ailments. We've got a surreal wee oral history from our old pal, Captain Dugald McCormick, who was born in 1877. And he tells us of Dr. John Beaton, who was famous in his area and came up with some strange old school cures for odd ailments. Tragically for John Beaton, his daughter was incredibly sick and he could never figure out what was wrong with her? After much suffering, eventually the darkest night of his life came and his daughter died. He was haunted by not knowing the cause of her death and so he decided to dissect her body. He spotted that her stomach was moving and so opened the organ to see what was inside and lo and behold, out hopped a living frog. Baffled by this frog, he ordered his servants to keep it alive in water at the same temperature of the body and to feed it plenty. The servants of the house didn't really know what to think. They thought that perhaps Dr. Beaton had love for this frog as it had been a part of his daughter, though perhaps a part that shouldn't really have been inside her. And so they kept the evil little murderous gut frog alive and it thrived in its wee bucket of tepid water. That is until one day in March, when the cook was making nettle soup. The chef gave the frog a tiny wee frog-sized bowl of nettle soup, and the frog sipped it up quite happily. However, shortly after consuming the nettle soup, the frog was found dead. John Beaton learned of the fate of this frog, and he wept. Alas, alas, if only I'd known this cure, and then I could have saved my daughter. Well, I shall learn from this. I will tell all Highland families to make nettle soup in March and gi it to their children, for there is nothing that burdens the body that nettle soup cannot kill, not even a wee frog. <laughs> This must have been the advice that my mum was following. <laughs> However, I can't contradict this more. <laughs> because my love of nettle soup has gotten me into a pyramid scheme with mermaids. And no amount of nettles can cure this corporate underwater greed. <laughs> but this is a story that I've found a few different variations of about this same island doctor. In one story, it was just called a little beast in the stomach. So I'm wondering mm. if the frog is somehow representing a demon, maybe? Perhaps an evil supernatural presence of some kind. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably veer with that interpretation because frogs can't really survive in stomach acid, but demons definitely can. On such a horrible note, shall we get a wee message from our lovely sponsors? <laughs> who have yeah. nothing to do with frogs in the stomach. <laughs> a big thanks to our sponsors of this episode, Weebox, who managed to pack the joy and excitement of this beautiful country into a wonderful Weebox. Weebox is a monthly subscription gift box 
that is designed to share Scotland with Scots and Scots at heart all over the world. We Box select delights that are often exclusive or can't be bought outside of Scotland. It's a fantastic gift and great value for money. Plus, We Box supports Scottish businesses, artisans, the environment and charities too, which are all things that we adore. Visit webox.co.uk and use code STORY10, that's STORY10, at the checkout for an exclusive discount. Yay, Webox! Yay for Webox! Nettles and ferns are two of the most overlooked wonders of Scottish nature. They are hardy plants that are well suited to our cold, damp, changeable climate, meaning that they are both very successful in the wild. Their commonality and consistency throughout Scotland has resulted in large bodies of folklore that stretch back hundreds of years. I love ferns and nettles as an integral part of our landscape and folklore. They are beautiful plants in their own right, and though we've looked more at the mythological side of things, they both have practical uses for people who lived in fern or nettle-rich glens. We have rough ferns, the brackens, which were once used for everything from thatching to keeping tatties fresh to bedding for livestock. And then, of course, nettles are delicious, and I advise everyone to eat them. But remember, pick them with your gloves on. Lots of nice thick winter gloves. (laughs) Many thanks to all our sponsors and the Royal Society of Literature for supporting this episode. And thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Stories of Scotland. We have now been making this show for over three years, which kind of just blows my mind. Um, But it really wouldn't have been possible without you, our wonderful listeners. Thank you so much for supporting us, for returning each episode and for sharing us with your family and friends. If you've been with us from episode one or if this is your first ever listen, we really, really appreciate it. I especially appreciate the recent review that gave us a gazillion stars. That's exactly how many (laughs) stars I want. (laughs) Yes, of everyone, when you do go and give us a review, if you could just give us a gazillion, that's what we're after. Thank you. (laughs) The bar has been raised significantly higher than it was before. (laughs) Used to be five stars, not anymore. A gazillion (laughs) stars will bring up our medium. (laughs) If you've been enjoying our show and would like to help your favourite independent podcasters as we continue our winding journey through the moors and mountains of Scottish histories, then you can support us on Patreon. Subscribing to Patreon gives you access to our entire back catalogue of wide-ranging We Patreon segments and also gives us big smiles. Yay! If you head over to patreon.com slash stories of Scotland, you can sign up now. And a big welcome to our newest patrons. Scott B, Jennifer, Dita, Scott S, Aubrey and Lauren. Thank you all so, so much. I like to thank a few all as joining me on the eve of St. John the Baptist as we pluck a fern seed under the moonlight and become invisible. We then run down to our favourite cave. I think mine is still Kaisi Cave after all this time. We're going to Kaisi Caves and we're going to become little goblins and we're going to have a wonderful little (laughs) goblin party. So one of you, I'm certain, is crafty enough to make us a beautiful little goblin disco ball. And then I'm sure one of you is crafty enough to make us cool little different coloured goblin candles that when they glimmer off our goblin disco ball, give our cave a kind of ravey vibe. I'm certain that one of you is going to be, or maybe more of you, are talented musicians, little (laughs) goblin musicians. So we've become invisible, that somehow turned us into goblins, and we are now having a big party in a cave and it's as happy as I've been. Now I I am making us a, a three course meal. So we're starting so. with with nettle soup which is delicious but it doesn't have any negative impact on our fern seeds don't worry. And then our main is mushroom stroganoff with 
a side of delicious nettle risotto. And I've covered that all in a gorgeous nettle pesto. Yum, 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 yum. That's nice. That's good. Yeah. And then we're having a dessert, which is, of course, nettle ice cream. (laughs) Um, I've glazed that with a little bit of a nettle and rose hip syrup. And it's gorgeously green. I'll make a little nettle twill on the side. That's just a nettle leaf. I'm sorry, guys. Like, don't touch it. It might sting you. Just grab it really hard. (laughs) (laughs) We've all got our respective roles for our goblin party. Okay. (laughs) And then when we've got a little bit too excited on my nettle wine, then we play a game that me and my brother used to play when we were children. Which is called <laughs> Run Away from the Nettle. So <laughs> you, essentially, you essentially pick a nettle and then you chase each other with it until someone gets stung. <laughs> and that was a game that me and my brother played all the time. And I think I think that maybe maybe I'll play that game with myself and our patrons can do their beautiful music and goblin disco ball and goblin candles and right. goblin feasting and <laughs> okay. i'll just chase myself with the nettle all right well that sounds like a kind of good time so <laughs> a great time that sounds like a great time with some great food in there honestly i'd like to eat all of that until next time dear listeners slanjava slanjava We are just podcasters, not medical experts. Please don't do anything we say ever. Ever. (laughs) Unless joining our Patreon. You should join our Patreon. That's the one thing (laughs) you should do that we say. (laughs) Who do we know that has cloven hoofs? Landowners. People who buy property as holiday homes in the Highlands and decimate Highland society and culture in the process of trying to fill the hollowness that eats them from the inside out every working moment of the day. (laughs) Okay. But I don't think I'd risk splitting hairs with the devil. (laughs) I don't recommend it to any. (laughs) I just really wanted to get my learner chuckle in. (laughs) <laughs> learn it uh, learn it chuckle <laughs> is it not creepy to scare players in a changing room yeah it's all point I'm trying to be creepy <laughs> <laughs> consumption was the common name for tuberculosis so consumption was supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. <laughs> oh, Jenny. 